To many of you, this discography review series will not come as a surprise. It's only a handful of times that you have a band that has a 13 year plus gap between albums and really whenever it comes to the history of this channel we have never had the opportunity to talk about a tool release and that's going to be changing this Friday as of the date this video was recorded. So while we're going to be talking about the presents very soon I think that since we've never talked about a tool album on this channel we should go back to the past and leave our mark on what we've thought or at least what I've thought about these releases throughout the years because despite what the one tool related video from six months or nine months ago stated I'm actually a fan of the band and have been for a long time and this is a group that despite they're going to only be releasing their fifth studio album have felt like they've had a more magnificent uh, sort of legacy that has been left behind prior to Fear Inoculum even hitting stores. So let's explore that legacy a little bit. What has made Tool into the band that they are now, where the excitement for Fear Inoculum is really at a fever pitch? To do that we have to go all the way back to Undertow. We have to go back to their very first full-length release. We're not going to be talking about opiates, though it was certainly instrumental in helping them getting to this place. In the year 1993, we got Undertow, the very first full-length Tool album, and it was one that was immediately able to spark some controversy, which they had done so a bit before that, though not on a really widespread level with the track Hush off of Opiates, which was a direct response to the PMRC, which at that time was only a couple of years old and still held a significant amount of power. If you need to know about the PMRC, look it up. It was kind of a ridiculous time for music, and a lot of artists tended to be highly critical of that. However, with Undertow, the first source of controversy was the song Prison Sex, which was the immediate first single that this band was offering to the world on a much wider scale. And this was one that, that was immediately pulled from MTV after a couple of showings. And it was mostly because of the lyricism, which was depicting child abuse, as well as the imagery of uh, the video itself. These two things, lyricism and imagery, while not necessarily completely co-related with this band, are two of the trinity of aspects that really make Tool into sort of this phenomenon that a lot of people latch on to. The visual aspect that they've been able to provide with their music videos, with their packaging, with their artwork, has not only been a source of controversy throughout the years, but has also been one of the things that fans have latched onto. With Undertow needing censored copies, including one that featured just a large barcode on the front of it, which was one part in response to it, but in a second part, another direct shot at consumerism, which is very, very interesting, but it's just the way in which Tool handles their business. Now the album itself is a lot heavier and harder than what we have heard from Tool perhaps in the past 20 years within their last two albums, Lateralis and 10,000 Days. Fear Inoculum remains a mystery until this Friday. But this was one when the, uh, the band was still really somewhat attached to the heavy metal scene. Interestingly enough, two members of this group, Maynard and Adam, were former members of Green Jelly. And again, Wikipedia is your friend on that group. If you remember the song Three Little Pigs, gold star for you. But whenever they came together and started their own project, they still retained some of that heaviness, which was seen on Opiate, and once again was present here on Undertow, but it was dialed back a little bit from its predecessor. And this is uh, easily seen on songs such as Prison Sex, and then going right into Sober, which still maintains itself as perhaps the biggest hit of Tool's early career, and perhaps still one of the most played songs in their discography on any sort of national or you know international radio, uh, this track really helped to propel this band, and this is an album that has sold more than 3 million records directly on the backs of songs such as those, as well as the legend that has surrounded the band since. This heavier sound was offset a little bit by some interesting choice in rhythm, as well as some very experimental facets. This was something that, in the early 1990s, was prevalent within the music scene. If you go back and listen to Alternative, there's a couple of different camps that you immediately think about. You think about grunge, or you think about the radio alternative, but then there was this underground, this vast wasteland that was just filled with sonic pioneers. Groups such as the Rollins Band, or just Henry Rollins in general, interloping with the Melvins and others, created this sort of 
free expression that is still enjoyed in some cases and in some circles today, though it no longer boasts that sort of in-your-face approach that it did back in the 1990s. And by in-your-face, I don't necessarily mean by composition standards, but in the fact that this style of music was getting a chance. It was getting the option and the opportunity to be heard thanks to MTV, thanks to The Box, thanks to VH1, etc. These were tools that certainly helped Green Jelly and also very much so helped Tool. And the visual style of their music videos also directly led to increased success. They were becoming a bit of a phenomenon, although it was still being considered a cult phenomenon. They wouldn't really reach the height of that early cult power until later on in the decade. But songs such as Four Degrees and Swamp Song and even the finale, which is a 15 minute long experimental do-rag that involves two pianos and some shotguns, yeah, it's in there. There's obvious relationships to Bill Hicks as far as a hero, uh, you know, hero slash, you know, worshiper is concerned. They definitely felt that Bill was an ally rather than somebody that they were directly against. And you hear a lot of imagery on the lyricism of this album that is certainly not just the, the norm for what you would uh, typically hear on the radio or maybe even consume within uh, an album itself. There was philosophy that was included with this, there was a lot of controversial imagery, the booklet itself contained that, and really the one thing that perhaps leaves the most lasting impression, the one thing that perhaps was the best introductory voice, was the actual voice. Whenever fans heard Maynard's voice for the first time, it immediately attached itself as something different, which was kind of hard to do in a land where different was now cool. We're, a land, we're in a land where that sort of anti-establishment angst was one of the biggest flavors of the month. And here Maynard came, almost seeming like the counterculture to the counterculture. It was a voice that was clear and crisp, but did also have a lot of personality to it. There was a lot of emotion that was driven behind it. And the music that was swirling around it, whether it was heavy or whether it was dialed back into a little bit of polyrhythm sampling in order to see what fits, you know, throwing polyrhythm spaghetti on the wall, it created something that felt truly unique at the time. And really to this day, it's an important foundation point for exactly what Tool was really destined to become. It was a great building block and they were still fighting a war against censorship and privacy. There were still so many aspects, visually and lyrically, about Tool's music that was not being accepted. And as a result, that's where Undertow's legacy really is present. It's in this very heavy mix, probably their heaviest album. It's in the fact that all of these different ideas crafted a bit of an aura around Tool, that they were fighting the good fight, and that they were going to go about this their way. That they weren't going to be following a script throughout their careers. And, naturally, that's been exactly what's happened. Here's something that might make all of you feel a little bit old. Or something that might make you wish that this was still true. It only took three years, three, for the next full length for Tool to come out. So I hope that you'll join me next time whenever we move past Undertow and go to 1996, where Tool's Auto would only grow with the release of Anima. I'm Cover Killer Nation, and I'll talk to you next time. Take care.